Welcome back, subscribers. It's Jody Hopper, and I'm super pumped at the moment. I was able to take part in the press conference. <laughs> listen to me, listen to me. Like, like, I do this all the time, and if I go out at the, at the house with the little girl that has this toy? Yes, you heard me. Racer X, MX Sports, they allowed me to speak <gasps> at the press conference. I even got the mic turned off on me because I like to talk a lot. But I think they were all blown away that as smart man Barney Stinson once said, it's time to suit up. Suit up! So I was able to ask some decent questions and see if I can go further, get in touch with the right people, and then we can start moving forward with this whole privateer power movement thing and asking some questions that other people aren't willing to ask and just spice it up a little bit, make it a little bit more entertaining to watch as opposed to being fairly bland. And I don't care if the writers don't like me, that's fine. I, I do a, a decent enough job making myself look bad, so whatever. Anyway, it was round one at Loretta Lynn. I can't believe I said that. Loretta Lynn. Yeah series is only nine races. Do you think that that might make an asterisk to the series just because it's condensed? Or do you actually think it might make it a harder series because there's... So you guys all probably watched the race. And if you didn't, it's on that MX Sports Gold package that sucks to say that no money is going to the riders. But we won't get into that subject as of yet. Yes, the TV schedule is very hard to at least watch the race. You know, I know some guy posted on YouTube, which hopefully his channel doesn't get taken down via copyright, but that's beside the point. If you want to watch the race, you can find it. I'm going to go through some of the things that I thought were worth mentioning. And the first one is going to be the track. I know MX Sports openly said that they were only going to race here because of the circumstances and we'll never see this national again. But I actually asked some of the riders in the press conference what they thought about that. And here's the response I got. Just your opinion, Shane. Would you be open <clears throat> to racing this track again? Do you think it's something that should be on the series just here forward? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's probably... Um, if it were on the schedule, it'd probably be the only one that has zero elevation. And it's, I mean, dirt-wise, it, it can have the similar dirt to other tracks, but just the way that the track's laid out there, and, and it's pretty tight. I mean, after racing today, it's been seven, seven years since I raced here as an amateur. So, I mean, I, I've obviously watched Loretta's every year, like on, on the live feed, but dude, that, that track is a tough track to ride. And so I kind of, kind of gained a little more respect for the amateur guys that, that race it, um, after racing it today, but it, um, yeah, I feel like with it being tighter, I mean, that's, that's kind of not the norm for an outdoor track. So it would be, um, another one of those technical tracks that, that kind of puts, I don't know, uh, a twist on things that you don't you don't get the normal normal results like like you would i mean um it was uh it was really good today i think with uh the section right off the start um i think taking that switch back out as well as the switch back out to the ten commandments i think that that made the track a lot more suitable to hold a, a pro race so um i think the rain kind of kind of mess with us a little bit because there there were only a few lines uh that were decent so it's uh it was a tough racetrack today but i think it does have some potential uh i'm gonna look like an old man here 2009 was the last time i was at loretta and it was still kind of the same layout but you got in one rut and it was slot car racing all the way around the whole thing because it was just so gnarly and deep. To me, that screams professionalism as far as when it comes to motocross. You want to have this European style, just nasty track. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of elevation, but anyone can go fast on a smooth track. When it's that gnarly, that's when the real men come out. And now, we're talking about men. 
you know, I don't, I don't really know where I'm going with this one. Anyway, the next guy I'm going to talk about is Tomac. We all see him just straight up just hit a wall that first moto. His bike setup didn't look that great. I know there's all these rumors going on that, oh, his contract's only good through 2021. He wants to retire. He's not having any fun. And I can see that. I, I totally see that. The dude works his ass off, constantly works his ass off. I personally don't think a lot of these pros are having that much fun. Yeah, they have fun when they're making millions of dollars and are getting the recognition for that. But the guy's fifth on, I don't necessarily think they're having that much fun risking their lives week in and week out when it's this nasty. And if you guys have ever been to Loretta, dude, it is hot, humid, it's always raining, it sucks. And racing 35 minutes, it just sounds like, no, why should I put up with this? It's awful. So I could see potentially maybe he got tired, but he later said that it was all bike setup. I wanted to ask him some questions about where'd he go? Did he go stiffer, softer, faster, slower? What did they do? Not just saying that they changed something because we saw in Moto2, he was hopping over some bumps. He was able to really put on a hard charge on Osborne, but ultimately didn't get it done. But because of the way the point system works, he was able to get on the podium. So I'm guessing you guys probably have some theories out there as well. I wanna know what you think happened to Tomac in that first moto because second moto was definitely our normal crazy super fast late in the moto Tomac. I was able to ask him if it bothered him that a rookie like Chase Sexton shows up and has the fastest qualifying time and just like AC did back in Supercross see if it bugged him and here was his response. Oh gosh, if he does it like nine weekends in a row like AC, yeah, then it's going to bother me. But uh, I don't know if it's one or two, then, then kind of whatever, because there's a lot, there's always a big learning curve that way. So um, I don't know, we'll see, see what he does. So honestly, the biggest surprise was Jason Anderson. If you saw my prediction video with Chris Cooksey, I didn't even have him in my top five. I know since he left Alden's, the Baker's factory, didn't really know where his program is going. For him to just get out front that first moto and in the first two laps, get like a six second lead, that was the best thing he could have done for himself, having a clean track. And those Huskies are looking good. He has now been on the podium two races in a row. I know this is round one, Johnny, but if I'm continuing to go back to the Salt Lake City Supercross, where he was on the podium too. So he's on there two times. Two, one, two. His second moto, I didn't feel, his second moto, I thought he just got tired, just personally. Heat, it's the end of the day, the track looked super, super gnarly. And once those guys just started clicking off and getting around him, he sort of lost the fight. And it wasn't until the ending of the moto, which sucks, which is just, even more demoralizing when you've almost have it in the bag. I was able to ask him in the press conference if having Washugal being canceled if that helped in recovery anyway, and if he was staying back. I even had a little bit of a, a joke in there as well. You, Jason, uh, you need to trademark that untouched jersey because you always seem to have it. And anyway, all, all kidding aside, with Washugal being canceled and it being across the country, does it help for recovery having you guys just literally be home-based in Tennessee having two rounds back-to-back? -back, or are you guys going home? Or are you guys staying? Um, I'm 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 going home. I got my flight out in the morning, so uh, I mean, just to Florida is not that far, and I think it's just going to be like a normal weekend. We're just coming back to the same track, so yeah. I think I think uh, I don't think it's going to change much going here, or Washougal. Only thing is, is we don't have to fly out on Thursday to go to Washougal from Florida, so um, yeah, it's basically just normal for us right now. 
but apparently I need to read my crowd. You need to understand the the Johnnies in this whole deal. So I don't know where we're going with this. After how much of the girl that has his toy? I guess we'll just go straight into Osborne. Osborne with the overall. Two back to backs. Dude. Dude completely changed his whole career around after he got back from Europe. I don't know how he did it. At this point, I personally think he's an old man, 30 years old. I'm 30 years old, I kind of feel like an old man. I'm retired, I really wasn't able to accomplish anything. And this is the best he's been in his career. And he's gonna try to win the Outdoor Nationals and the Supercross Series. And I think he has a shot especially if you got somebody like Tomac that just kind of has it in the back of his head that uh, sort of wanting out. I know he openly says he doesn't want out, but man, that dude is just super hard to read. You look at his face. And if motocross doesn't work out for him, dude needs to go into poker because he <laughs> has a poker face. The list goes on as far as notable mentions in the 450 class. We got AC, which we know he's gonna be fast. He just needs to put everything together. He was out front Moto2, but he did the James Stewart thing where he's gonna throw it away. And his crash looked fairly gnarly. And his bars were all bent. The Bermuda Triangle is not giving him the inside. Oh, 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 oh. And we didn't really see him get back on the track as it looked like he got lapped. And I get this question a lot, and I don't really know if I've really expressed my feelings about it. When you're a factory rider, it's a little bit different. Well, I've never been a factory rider, so I can't really speak on their behalf, but I'm going to anyway. So it's very easy for a factory rider to get back on the track because he's got some championship points that he's got to get, try to fight for because there's huge bonuses at the end of the year for those championship points. For, let's just say, Blank Rider is in the top 40, and he crashes at in 25th place. What motivation does he have to get back out there? I personally don't think there's a whole lot of motivation to get back out there to risk injury, hurt the bike more, because you're not going to get inside the top 20 when you start finally getting a pay raise as far as purse money. And we all know that the purse money isn't extravagant to begin with. It's all sponsorship money. So unless you have a real sponsorship contract, which if you're outside the top 20, I don't think you do anyway, there's just no motivation to continue to ride, which sucks in this sport. You're in the top 40, you should want to be able to finish. We've all been taught as a kid, you get up, you never give up, you finish. There's something in the finishing. So what motivation does he have? Pay isn't there potentially a better qualifying spot at the next round. Well, he's already in the motos, which means he's probably gonna be in A practice for the next round, which A practice does help in qualifying. Other than that, there's really no upside to continuing to go out there and suffer. So you just phone it in, which sucks. I would like the sport not to, to be pushing these riders to make those decisions. Even though they're not outright saying this, but just because of the way it's set up, that's how it's being perceived by at least a, a privateer of my statue, at least. I need to talk to some more riders to see how they feel, but I have a feeling that they feel pretty damn close to how I feel. And just moving on to the more notable mentions, Marvin with his huge ACL, a fourth and a fifth, I thought that that was great. He showed that he had the speed. I think this next Loretta Lynn race, he might actually be on the podium. and. I shouldn't have written him off before because he is one of the best riders in this series, bar none. And Cooper Webb, he had flashes of brilliance. That second moto, I feel really didn't do him justice. He's the type of rider that needs to start out front to finish out front. He's not a Tomac or an AC or a Sexton where he can just come smoking through the, the field. He has to start in front of these riders to finish in front of these riders. And I, Max Anstein, in that hemp Suzuki, 11th overall. Best Suzuki, or at least he was the top Suzuki. Imagine what he could do if he was on a Jap bike. I think I'll just leave it with that. So let me know in your comments below how much you hate Suzuki and how much you love Suzuki and how much you love Max Anstein. 
Last rider in the 450 class was Barsha. Barsha blew me away that first moto on that turd Yamaha. He must be on the new 2021 Yamaha, not the 2020, because I rode the 2020 and I hated it, but I'm a shorter rider. Barsha is a shorter rider. Pretty much nobody on a 450 Yamaha has ever been able to do anything with it. Even if you have a skill level like James Stewart, it argued that he was sort of at the end of his career when he got on that. But ever since then, it's just been very difficult for these guys. When you look at the 250s, that dream team that they have with Cooper, McArath, and Dylan, I didn't even say Ferrandez, Ferrandez, dude, I think I might be getting that finally. Those bikes, by far the best 250 bikes. The 450 doesn't have that. Barsh had a good finish in the second moto, so I'm going to be looking for him as well to be up there. <laughs> Moving on to the 250s, RJ with that ACL. It's been three months, four months. Dude, I don't know what he did, but that second moto is very emotional for him. That's all I can really say, dude. Uh, even be in this situation, uh, have this team, my family here this weekend. Uh, I wish we could have got a win, but uh, man, that felt good. I, uh, I tried to hang on, but... Uh... There had to have been a lot of the narrative going on with what he had to go through as far as push through to be able to race at this level. I'm not saying that he didn't do the work. That's ex exactly the opposite of what I'm saying is. I'm saying he put in the physical therapy hours. He put in everything to be able to make this work because this race track deep ruts, super deep ruts, rough, is not a track you want to be on if you have a hurt knee because it's damn near impossible not to dab your foot. So this guy is going to be racing up front the rest of the year. Do I think he's on par with the Frenchman? Oh, absolutely not. I feel we should just hand Dylan the championship right now and move on, let him get his gas gas ride or his Yamaha ride, let him get in the 450s because he pretty much has this in the bag. You know, I'm, I'm quoting, I'm pretty sure Dylan has this in the bag. But back to RJ, four months just sounds very fishy to me. I worked my ass off to get back to racing in two and a half months and it was the worst decision, one of the worst decisions of my career. I've actually had quite a few and you know, starting a YouTube channel might be one as well, it might be up there. I just, th there had to have been something out of the ordinary to help him do this because genetically bodies are not so different. Somebody's not 10 times better than another person as far as physical capabilities when you're looking at riders that are, hey, 155, 155, 155. You can't go, hey, this guy's a six foot tall guy and this guy's three foot. Of course, he's gonna have better basketball capabilities. We're, we're kind of having a level playing, playing field with uh, motocross athletes here. So I do think there's something there that, who knows, I, I can speculate a bunch. And that's what I'm good at, criticizing and speculating. So apparently um, you guys like listening to it too. So Jay Martin, it seemed like he got into it with his brother in that second moto on the Suzuki. Suzuki was holding him up, no pun intended, and it sort of, took his forward momentum and not to mention he lost his goggles. I was able to ask him in the press conference, you know, if his brother and him had words after the race and how he thought about maybe not losing his goggles and how's he going to beat Dylan. Here's that little tidbit. Yeah, I mean, Alex and I, we had dinner tonight, you know, and we were harping on each other pretty good already. You know, he's talking shit to me and I was talking shit to him. So uh, we talked about the race already for sure. But he really surprised me. Dude's a veteran. He's expected to win. I had him at my most disappointment because if he's not winning, he's a disappointment. So by that definition, him finishing third place, is that a disappointment when you're expected to win? Maybe. We'll see if this continues. If he finishes third for the series, yeah, I would say that's kind of a disappointing series for a two-time champ and somebody that needs to get a ride for 450s and his age isn't helping him either. It's it's difficult. for If I was in J. Martin's shoes, man, you would have to lay everything all on the line because your years are winding down 
and there's younger people up that are showing more potential like Sexton and AC that are gonna lead the 450 class. And this might be the hardest year for him to even make that kind of a statement because of the type of riders that are in the 250 class right now with, with Dylan. So, I spieled a lot. Let me know what you think. Check out that press conference. And I'm going to try to get into more of them and try to ask some more difficult questions and go from there. It's on Racer X channel. And until next time. This is Johnny Hopper. I'm going to pass out. Oh, I think I'm like that. <laughs> and I just have to say thank you to the response I've gotten for being <laughs> snuck into the press conference just the response with all the comments on Racer X channel as far as hey Johnny I believe he's great for our sport you know keep doing this uh, we need that kind of a personality I know I did not join Racer X uh, yeah there's a couple nasty ones on here uh, that's good and all I, I feel like words hurt the vulnerable so whatever but I just want to say I am blown away at you guys supporting me and supporting the privateers and hopefully we can ask some harder questions get some answers some different questions and see if we can build this sport up and make it better and make it safer thanks guys